How is he, Doctor? He's resting. He seemed quite relieved to talk to me about his dreams. What did you make of them? Well, I'll have to take them some time to study them, try to discover the deeper meanings. But I can tell you that right now, he's very disturbed. Oh, the poor child. Well, of course he's disturbed. He's terrified. But the question is why and how real is it? Oh, a patient's fears are always real because they're rooted in the only ultimate subjectivity. His own existence, his own experience. Doctor, do you think this might have something to do with David's past? Well, it might just be possible that uh, David has never accepted his mother's death. And because of this, death is more terrifying to him than it is to most people. You really think it's as simple as that? Well, why, for example, was the woman who appeared to him, the one who uh, dangled the shiny medallion in front of him, a submerged figure, why did she have no identity? Perhaps because the very thought of his mother's death is so painful to him that he has to keep it at a distance, try to cover it up, so to speak. Well, it's true, he never talks about his mother. Ah, but he's very attracted to her. Why else would she dangle that medallion in front of him, try to lure him? What about Sarah? Yes, yeah, Sarah. Well, first of all, we'll have to admit that all children have imaginary companions. Oh, of course they do, but not dead ones. Well, that's an answer I don't presume to know yet. But then again, it might very well fit in with David's inordinate fear of death. How? By making Sarah a dead child, his dear companion, David is trying, uh, subconsciously speaking, symbolically, to uh, make friends with death, to reconcile himself with it. You understand? Yes, I think so. But it's a reconciliation that uh, he obviously can't come to by himself. He's torn, he, he wavers. Just as Sarah is his attempt to come to terms with death, Barnabas is the fear of death come back again. But why Barnabas? Perhaps there's something about him. His height, his shape, the shadow he casts that frightens the boy. Why Barnabas and no other person is something that isn't easy to know. might very well be the striking resemblance of the present Barnabas to his ancestor. You remember the old nursery rhyme, I do not like thee, Dr. Thell, for the reason I cannot tell, but this I know and very well, I do not like thee, Dr. Fell. Yes, that applies to the real Barnabas. Now what he as a person represents to David is something I can't tell. But the imaginary Barnabas, the one that David has created in his dreams, is one that I understand a little better. He is the fear of death. He's always there. Now, sometimes he can be put in his coffin, put down, so to speak. But he always rises up again. An overwhelming sight with his fangs bared, ready to gobble up the boy. Doctor, what can I do to help him? For a while, keep him here and see that he stays calm. Keep him away from Barnabas Collins. I'm sure Barnabas will understand and not take uh, David's reaction personally. Well, he's already shown a great deal of patience in a very awkward situation, hasn't he, Dr. Woodard? Dr. Woodard? Uh, oh, what? Is something the matter? Uh, no, no, nothing at all. Well, you seemed a million miles away. Yes, I was. I, I was just thinking of what Dr. Fisher here just told us. I'm sorry, Mrs. Stoddard, but I've got to go somewhere and do something immediately. If you'll just excuse me. Well, yes, of course. Doctor, I want to thank you for all the time and attention you've devoted to David's problem. Let's hope we're closer to a, uh, closer to a situation now than we were before. A solution, I'm sure we are. I'll go out with you, Doctor. Uh, after I've gone over my notes thoroughly, Mrs. Stoddard, I'll uh, get in touch with you and we'll bring David over to my office. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Liz, I guess I'll head back to town, oh, too. Burke, would you mind waiting for a few minutes? Not at all. Goodbye, Doctor. Thank you again. What's on your mind, Liz? Something about David? No, 
we got to talk about something that concerns you and Vicky. Well, what is it? Well, I had a letter from my lawyers today, and I'm afraid they gave me some news that you're not going to like at all. Let's go in there. Don't keep me in suspense, Liz. What's the bad news? It's about the house you want to buy from me. Do you remember that old deed I found that was marked not for sale? Yes. Well, according to my lawyers, I have to abide by that deed and an old family will. Would well, they tell you why? Well, it seems that the last member of the family to live in the house was called Caleb Sayers Collins. And he apparently had a morbid fear of strangers. Well, what does that have to do with the house now? Well, he felt they were out to take everything he owned. He didn't marry because he felt a wife would steal from him. Sounds like a real charmer. He finally ended up a very, very old man all alone in the house, except for the things he collected. And he collected and hoarded just about everything. Including one very beautiful house. Well, the house was the thing he loved most. And so to protect it from falling into the hands of strangers after he was gone, he made a very unusual provision in his will. That the house could not be sold or passed down to anyone but a member of the Collins family for a period of 100 years. A hundred years? And to make certain the provision was carried out, he left a sum of money to pay the taxes on an empty house. Well, that's ridiculous. A house as beautiful as that and no one can live in it. I know, Burke. I, I wanted you and Vicky to have the house very much. What about breaking the will? Well, the lawyers think the matter could be brought to court, but it would take several years to invalidate the will, and the 100-year ownership after death clause will be over in five years. Well, that's great. That's just great. Five years. I guess there's a lot to be said for long engagements, but not, I'm not the one to say it. Vicky will be very disappointed, won't she? Yes, yes, she will be. She had her heart set on getting that place. Burke, I promise you, as soon as it's legally possible, you and Vicky will have that house. It will be my wedding present to you. Well, thank you, Liz. But I don't think we want to wait that long for the wedding. Oh, I don't mean that you should wait. Get married and live somewhere else. And then when the house is available, move into it. Yes. I suppose we could. I'm sorry, Burke. I was so sure the news would be good news. It didn't work out that way, did it? No. No, it didn't work out that way. Tell me about some of these things that you know. Why? To help David. I'm mad at David. Because he told your secret. 
Yes. I think he had to tell it. Can you understand that? Because he was afraid, just like Maggie was afraid. That's right. You know Maggie too, don't you? You gave her a doll. Yes, because she was sad and afraid. That was very kind of you, Sarah. Do you know why Maggie and David are so frightened? No. No, I don't. Sarah, I'm hoping that you're going to be a very good little girl and... and tell me. Sarah, Sarah, you've got to tell me about some of these things that you know. It, it's terribly important. I don't think I should do that. Why not? Because people don't keep secrets anymore. They're always giving them away. Aren't you fond of David? Of course I am. Well, so am I. That, that's why we're here, isn't it? You have my flute. I like to play it a lot. Then it, it is your flute that David found, isn't it? Of course. We didn't believe him when he told us that. In fact, many people don't believe that anything that David says, they think he tells lies, and that's, that he's very sick. I was sick once. I know that. Sarah, when was that? How long ago? Oh, a long, long time ago. When you were six, something happened, didn't it? David did told they... me that. Yes, yes. Yes, he did. You know, Sarah, that some people think that David ought to be put away for treatment. In a big room? Just like Maggie was? That's right, in a big room with bars. Well, you wouldn't want that to happen to David, would you? No. Well, then, then if you've got to tell me, tell me the things you know. I don't think I should do that. Oh, Sarah, tell look, you're, you're all alone on the earth, aren't you? Yes. Well, it must be very lonely for you at times. Sometimes. But not, not when you're with David, when you... When you're playing with David, you're not lonely, are you? No. Well, if they put David away, why, then you'll be all alone again for a very long, long time. You wouldn't like that, would you? No. Then, if you please me, I'll promise that no one will put David away. What do you want to know? Sarah. Sarah, is there a secret room here in the mausoleum? Sarah, Sarah, tell me. Where is it? On the other side of that wall. But this is where, this is where David went yesterday. <laughs> Couldn't get in. I know. Yesterday the door was sealed. Well, who sealed it? Somebody who wanted it closed, but I wanted it open, so I unsealed it. Oh, that... It exists. It exists just, just the way David said it did. Well, if this exists, then what about all the other things he's been telling us? And what, a, what about all those things? The coffin. He, he said it was empty. It is empty. One more thing that David didn't lie about. One more piece fitted into place. Sarah. Sarah. Has the coffin always been empty? I don't know about always. <laughs> you don't know about always, but Sarah, well, what do you know about? I mean, was it just waiting here for someone who, who died and then couldn't be buried in it for some reason? I don't understand. I think you do understand. It's I don't understand. Because it's so fantastic. Sarah, was there anyone ever buried in this coffin? Now, you've got to tell me so I can help David. He's in serious trouble. I can't tell you. I can't. And Sarah, I'm going to have to try to figure it out for myself. An empty coffin waiting for someone who died. Someone who died terribly and horribly and perhaps shamefully. Someone who died and then for some reason couldn't be buried in the usual place. 
the usual way. So his coffin stands empty. Is that the reason, Sarah? Is that it? Tell me. No, no. Well, this coffin wasn't always empty. Someone was buried here. I know that now. Oh. Yes, someone who wouldn't stay dead. Someone whose desire to return to light was so strong they had to wrap him in chains. But he broke those chains and left, leaving his coffin empty. Who was he, Sarah? Who... Who was buried here? Sarah! No way at all of buying that house. Not for the next five years, there isn't. The old crackpot who owned it really saw to that. I'm sorry, Vicky. I know how much getting it meant to you. Yes. Well, look, it isn't the only house in the world. We can buy another house right here in Collinsport. I suppose so. Vicky, I have to go out of town for a few days on business. And when I come back, we have something very important to do. What? Well, first, we're going to set a date for the wedding. And then we're going to look for the best house we can find and get it all furnished before the wedding. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure we can do it so soon. Well, I am. Now, the first order of business will be the house. After all, Mr. and Mrs. Burke Dublin have to set up somewhere, don't they? Hmm? If they're married, yes. Well, now, what's that supposed to mean? You do still want to marry me, don't you? Yes, of, of course I do, but we can't just rush into it, can we? Rush? Vicky, we didn't meet last night in the moonlight. We've known each other for quite some time now. Please, try to understand the way I feel. To me, not being able to get that house. Well, it, it was like getting a message. What kind of a message? A message that, that we shouldn't get married, at least not right now. Well, I'm sorry, that's one message I refuse to accept, so send it back. Burke, please don't get annoyed. I'm not annoyed, I just... All right. I am annoyed and disappointed. I may be in the process of losing you. Oh, no, you're, you're not losing me, and we will be married, but it, it just can't be right now, that's all. When can it be? Well, I, I don't exactly know. Yes, I do. When David is better. And when is that going to be? I wish I knew. Of course, I should have realized. That's what the conversation's been about, not about the house, but David. Brooke, I can't leave him now the, the way he is. And, and, and suppose they got a new governess who didn't understand him. Anyway, I'm not just his governess, I'm his friend, and you are too, aren't you? Yes. And he's your friend, he, he worships you, Burke. You know, he finds it easier to talk to you than he does to his own father. Yes, I know. If, if we got married now, he wouldn't have anyone. We'd be off somewhere. I keep remembering, waking up and... And hearing him scream that night, he had a terrible dream. All right, Vicky. What is it you want to do? Just wait. And I'd like you to wait, too. And try not to be annoyed with me or with David. All right. I'll wait. I couldn't really be annoyed with you, you know that. Nor with David, either. But old Caleb Collins, that skinflint, wherever he is, at him I'm very annoyed. Well, I can't blame you for that. I'm also disappointed. And believe it or not, I'm frightened. Of what? Of losing you. Of something taking you away from me. Of something fighting me to possess your love. Oh, Burke, nothing is going to take me away from you. <laughs> 